Okay, good morning. This is episode seven of Brave Indigenous Conversations with Joan Jack. And as you can see on the screen, I've learned something new. We have our guest here, but I'm gonna I'm going to do the opening that I'm sort of that's evolving. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago, I heard this piece of writing, and it really impacted me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. It's called "An Invitation to a Brave Space." Together, we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify, amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We, eat, we call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space and, to, and we will work on it side by side. That was written by Mickey Scott B. Jones and I was deeply impacted. So I'm gonna to continue to share it until I don't feel like sharing it. So before I uh, invite our guest to introduce himself, I just wanted to, for the new listeners, um, welcome. And for a couple of my loyal lifetime friends that are listening and standing by and supporting me, I just was reflecting this morning on how everything is teamwork. Everything is teamwork. So I just want to thank those people who are supporting me. And for those of you that are new, um, I created Brave Indigenous um, Conversations with Joan Jack because as loud as I am and as outspoken as I am, I still felt stifled. And I'm not the kind of person that can make a speech, like I could make a speech, but I don't enjoy it. What I enjoy is visiting because that's our culture. So I thought, well, why not invite? I know so many people. I'm sure I can get people to visit with me. So on that note, I'd like you to introduce yourself, Chief. Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, miigwech, Joan. Nibin Makwa, Nishnikas Makwan told him. I just introduced myself in my language, uh, Anishinaabemowin. I'm uh, known as uh, Summer Bear. I'm from the Bear Clan, but I'm also Derek Nipanak. And I'm the uh, the chief of the Minigozibi Anishinaabe. We're about 4,500 um Anishinaabe people living on the, the, the west shore of Lake Winnipeg Osis in, in, in what everyone now calls West Central Manitoba. Um, is, that a, is that enough introduction or should I go a little bit further? Dude, I can, it's our time together. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I call you Derek? I know you sure, don't mind. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, say what's in your heart. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm first of all, I'm honored to be requested to be on your show, Joan. I, I know that you have a, a very strong voice and you have a lot of people that tune into your messaging. So I'm, I'm happy to participate and contribute, if I can, in a positive way to, to, the, to those messages that, uh, that need to be shared. Um, you know, I've, been, I've been back home now for a couple of years. Uh, we're in a, a four-year term cycle in, in, in Minigo ZB. We, we also were called Pine Creek. Uh, for the longest time, we were called Pine Creek First Nation, you know, and before that, we were we were just the Pine Creek Indian Band. And and as as we try to reclaim our language and reclaim our culture and space and our land, we we go back to um, the Minigozibi Anishinaabe, which is you know uh, incorporating our language into our identity, which is I think very important for us. So before can that, you, in where can I interrupt you? Can you tell sure. people what Minigozibi means? Sure. Um, Mine, Minego would be like the pine tree. Is mm -hmm. my understanding that that's what that would be? It's like a compressed word, so we say Minego, but it's actually Minego. Wow. So it's it's um, uh, the way I understood it, pine tree. And of course, Zibing means moving water, so a creek or a river. So so mm -hmm. Pine Creek. So it's mm -hmm. a literal, almost a literal translation. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Anishinaabe, we we know what Anishinaabe means. Yeah. Um, so Human being. Yeah. <laughs> That's As hard. opposed to makwa, which is bear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, before this, you know, I was uh, I was I was doing private contracting work in the communities, um, working in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. 
Um, and of course, I was the Grand Chief at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs from 2011 to 2017. So I did two terms there. And then before that, I was chief in my community. Um, it's where I started out in the, in the leadership space, um, you know, in Indian government back home. Uh, back then, we called ourselves Pine Creek First Nation. And um, I started that as uh, fresh out of law school almost. I was doing my master's degree in Winnipeg. And, um, you know, I, I, I finished law school the year before. And then the aunties back home asked me to think about leadership. Um, they said, you'd be a good chief here. So um, I said, okay, if you want to put my name in. I, I never really thought I had a chance at, at, uh, at beating the incumbent um, because, you know, I'd been away for, for a lot of years from, from back home. And, but, but nonetheless, I won. I, I, you know, I, I won the election and that's kind of what put me into this pathway. I think, you know, for the longest time before that, I was being prepared for something. You know, when you're in school, you're wondering, where am I going to be? Where am I going? And I think yeah. I'm there, wherever I was supposed to be, wherever I was going, I think I'm there now. So um, I'm satisfied. I, I, I do the best I can with, with what I know. Awesome. I think it's great that you're at the, somebody, I mean, everybody who steps up for leadership is valuable and important. It's not an easy job, that's for sure. And, um, you know, you may as well just say, shoot me here. There's like a big target on your chest when you get elected to chief and council. Um, so I, I really honor that and recognize that in our leadership, which is not to say that I'm not one of the critics, you know. I mean, I think there's a need for full discourse and um, uh, all of this personal defensiveness that leaders have in our communities. Is, that's I'm tired of that already. Anyways, I digress. Um, no, I, that's an important point, Joan. I think I think I think I think what you're what you're identifying is that um, leadership means that you're going to be criticized, and, uh, and you have to be open to criticism uh, because I, I've I've seen and in my own work, criticism keeps you sharp. You know. Um, <laughs> We don't know everything coming into these roles in, in leadership, whether you're on council or whether you're a chief. And, and people are going to call you out on some of your, on what they believe to be or perceive to be some of your weaknesses and strengths. And and that's okay. You have to be okay with that. And you have to be comfortable um, knowing that you don't know everything and that mm -hmm. there's going to be challenges and there's going to be um, difficulty. And, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of leadership taking things personally, and that's why you see the defensive response from so mm -hmm. many, because it, it's, it, it can be scary at times. Even the strongest leaders are scared at times because they feel, um, you know, did we do something wrong? Did we misstep? Um, yeah. How do we fix it? And, and, and there's vulnerability in that. And, and you have to be willing to be vulnerable in leadership mm -hmm. if you're going to learn from it and if you're going to grow from it. So, so your point is very well taken. I appreciate that. Can you share a little bit with the listeners? Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of personal, but I mean, it's helpful too, though. Like, so at the beginning, I'm sure you didn't have the skill set to like, not be so hurt and wounded. I know I didn't like as a, an unofficial leader, I have a lot of people sharing their opinion with me about me all the time. <laughs> and at first I was wounded. I was like wounded. Eh? Like, so what have you done? <laughs> what have you done to, to avoid that wounding? Well, I, th I think uh, my very first day as a chief back in 2008, I, I brought in like a three or four page written speech for the council and for the members that came into the meeting. And um, I remember <clears> being <throat> so nervous and so uncertain. I started my day. I, I'll, I remember this very clearly. I went outside as the sun was coming up and offered tobacco. And I said, please, creator, give me the strength to do this the right way. You know, and... And um, I went into that meeting, I read my speech, shaking, the papers just shaking in my hands, you know, and, 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 and the, the, you know, the kind hearts of our people just watched and they listened. And um, what, what I did was I really leaned on what I thought and what I knew to be previous leadership, because part of my council included, you know, previous chief, uh, the, the late Clifford McKay back home. He, mm -hmm. he was our chief for a long time. So I was leaning on people I knew had leadership experience, but... I was also um, very heavily reliant on my own ego, Joan, <laughs> because here I was, I was a law graduate. You know, I did a first class honors BA at the University of Alberta in Native Studies, graduated from law school, went to Osgoode Hall, did the intensive program in Aboriginal lands, resources and governance. And I was doing my master's degree in Indigenous governance. So, so you know what, Joan, I knew everything. <laughs> I knew everything. <laughs> you know, and 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 what what when, when you when you when you ground yourself in Western education, 
um, you feel you've got the solution. So there's a little bit of security in that, but it's a false security. You know, yeah. it's, it's a false security. It's good to have that. But your tool belt of skills has to include, you know, uh, you, you have to know who your people are. You have to know who you are. You have to know the customs, cultures, and the ways of your people. You have to know who the families are. You have to know um, how people like to interact, just like we are right now. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be willing to go and sit at somebody's table and be criticized. You know, you, mm. you, these things took time for me to grow into. And, and it, it required me to almost shed, shed my skin. You know, to, mm -hmm. to, to recognize that, you know, I went to law school, I think I'm smart, but I don't know anything. I don't know <laughs> anything, you know, and, and, and it, it was experience that, that I gained during that time that helped me recognize, you know, th there's far more to leadership than, than your degrees after your name or the letters after your name. You know, there's, there's, you have to bring humanity into the space. And, mm -hmm. and in order for me to get there, I, like I said, I had to strip away a lot of what I thought was going to be good leadership and mm -hmm. that meant humbling myself to the reality and the truth of, of, of what we're experiencing as colonized people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I relied on my elders. I went to their sweats. Um, I received my, my, my pipe bundles, my drums, my drums came along during that time. I struggled. I struggled and I took everything personally because mm -hmm. I, I expected people to appreciate me. But the, the truth is, in leadership, you have to be willing to do your work without being appreciated. Amen. So I, I, I carried that. I carried that pain of not being appreciated. And I'm like, well, I just did this for our community. Doesn't anybody appreciate that? And <laughs> and and I think some people did. But you know, um, you have to be willing to do it selflessly. It's uh, not about it's not about getting a pat on the back for everything you do. You got to be willing to, to to just do the work and then to move on to the next day and do the next piece of work. And you know. In my mind, I don't know if I was ready for that. I, I, I thought I was owed something, I think, back then. And mm. I burned out, you know. Um, I burned out in that in that cycle, in that in that process. And then I, you know, I went to the AMC and I thought, well, maybe my skills are going to be better utilized here. And I, I continued to <laughs> continue to grow, continue to to get knocked down uh, and and stand back up. Um, and there was lots of highs and lows during that time as well. Um, during that time, I went to Sundance, and and that to me was was a very significant, uh, pivotal point in in my reclamation of of humanity in my own and in my own world and in my own life. I had to strip away what I thought was this important leader, and and I mm. reemerged uh, as myself, mm. and you know, always working to find comfort in who I am as a person, who I am as a dad, you know, who I am as a partner. And, and just trying to, to to live day to day and do what I can the best mm -hmm. way I can, and and that to me is 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 how I was forged into what I am now. And um, the learning will never stop. The the learning is always going to be there. Yeah. Um, I'm always going to be knocked down, but I'm always going to get back up and dust myself off and go back to the office and continue to to do what I, I believe is going to be the 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 way forward for us. So mm. that's, that's how I work now. Awesome. So I, I was, um, I want to share two things that it, it were awoken in me when you were sharing. Um, you know, my mom is a big, big part of my life. I mean, she dedicated 20 years of her life, you know, to Brian and I to look after our children, you know, when they were young, the three of us, we were like a three legged stool. And uh, mom started with me uh, in that, in that role. Uh, when I began law school, you know, I said, well, I don't know if you come with me, I'll go. You know, and so I didn't really want to go to law school, but <clears throat> so she said, I'll come. Like my mom is super curious and adventurous and strong and brave and free, amazing woman. And so one time after coming back into community life, like the process you've described is for those of us that go and get an education because our communities say, people say, go to school, get an education, get an education. And then most cases, I don't know about your community, but most cases, people come home and then they can't get the jobs. The jobs, all white people have the jobs mostly. And so there's like some kind of a rub going on there. But anyways, I was in that process of sort of re, reuniting, re, it's like, a, it's like a being reabsorbed, being reabsorbed back into community after having been in that institutional space. And my mom said to me, she was watching me. And I said, what? And she said, I'm so glad I never went to university. I said, why? And she said, because.
is I'm watching you struggle to reprogram your brain. And I don't have to do that. Like I'm right here and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like that's So that's what you're talking about, how it's all with the best intentions. You know, we go to school and we, we try to get things to help the people. And then, you know, the whole thing when you get home, it's like, what do you mean you don't want to do what I'm talking about? Like, don't you see what I see? <laughs> oh, and it's like, no, I need a new door at my house because we're cold. You know, that's where I am. Oh, Not to belittle that at all. It's just that in the communities, the issues are so, so different, you know? Absolutely. And then, yeah. I wanted to also say that I found it, I was struck when I thought I was owed something. Mm -hmm. What did you mean? What did you mean when you said that? Well, I, I think um, you know. I th I think oftentimes we 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 live our lives. Um, you know, like I invested heavily in education, just like you did, Joan. Like I was in school for you know eleven years. I think it was yeah. uh, my my undergrad. You know, I took I think five or six years to do my undergrad because I did a lot of it part time. And then my law degree, another three years after that. And then my master's degree, which I started, was, you know, that that's another year. So um, I, I forewent earning income during, you know, my, 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 my uh, early 20s right through to, to, to my early 30s. Um, sacrificing earning income to be in school, to be in classrooms, uh, lecture halls, uh, you know, receiving this knowledge and accepting this knowledge. So, so I felt there was a trade-off. I'm going to forego income so I can have some knowledge. And mm -hmm. then when I go out into the world, people owe me because I'm, I'm smart now. You know, <laughs> like, I, I think that was, that was part, that's part of, you know, how, how, how some of us think coming out of that institutional setting of Western education. Like I'm owed yeah. some money now. I'm, I'm owed <laughs> some, I'm owed something. I'm, I'm owed the pats on the back. I'm, I'm owed a good income. And, yes. and, you know, like, I, I think that that's, that's, that's one of the big, big challenges that we carry when we come out of that Western education is that, you know, we're, it's, it's almost like a sense of entitlement because mm -hmm. I've done this. I'm now, you, you now owe me something, but, but, but you have to let go of that because really um, to be in the service of the community is a, is a, is a, is a great, great responsibility and it's a privilege, you know, and, and no, and nobody owes anybody anything. It doesn't matter you could be in school for 20 years. Nobody owes you anything when you come out. You know, yeah. uh, your, your community doesn't owe you anything. Nobody owes you anything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that took some time for me to, to grow into that understanding. And, mm -hmm. and, and I'm there now. Like, nobody owes me anything. And that's how, <laughs> that's how I do my work as well, you know, uh, on, a, on a broader scale, you know, and how mm -hmm. I interpret treaty. Um, we spend so much time talking about treaty and who owes us this and who owes us that and the crown owes us this and the crown did. Uh, you know, a lot of that history is very, very true. And we have a lot of good reason to be mistrusting of, of, of institutions, colonial institutions and the way treaty has, has not been implemented. But, you know, at the end of the day, nobody owes anybody anything. We've got to, we've got to forge our own pathway into the future together. Um, we have to understand who we are. We have to understand the nature of our relationships with colonial governments, whether they're provincial or federal or municipal or city governments. And we have to shape our approach based on that with the understanding that nobody's going to give us anything for free. Nobody owes us anything. No. We've, we've got we've to earn our, our way through respect and balance in, in, in how we interact with one another at an individual level and, and an institutional level. Yeah. So that's um, kind of what I meant by that. <laughs> awesome. Well, I got it. I got it completely. I, I totally get it. For for a long time, I had a similar feeling that, you know, I wasn't appreciated. I wasn't valued, you know. And there's all, I could talk, we could talk about so many things, but I we only have a limited time. We have about a half hour left. And I'm really interested, or a bit more, whatever. I'm really interested in the work you're doing right now around health. So if, if you wouldn't mind uh, doing, this is an act of service for all of us. Um, sure. there. Like, start at the beginning, like as if you're talking to some white person who has no understanding of anything about us. They just think we get everything free. Talk. Mm -hmm. Start by talking to that guy. Sure, sure. Well, generations ago, our our ancestors went into ceremony, and and that ceremony led to the opportunity for new relationships to emerge with people that were coming from all over the world. Eh? And a lot of people that were coming to, to our lands were fleeing violence. 
because some of these cultures were were based on based in violence and the acquisition of space and the acquisition of wealth as it was understood was through violent acts upon one another so many people came here and and we 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 got to a point where treaties could be made and and when we went into treaty, we, we, we believe in a concept. It's almost like a philosophy. Um, my, my elder Harry Bone, he calls it uh, uh, it means that we have what we had before treaty, but then we have more because there's a new relationship. So there's additionality after treaty. They didn't take anything away with treaty creation. Um, they didn't create rights as they're currently being interpreted in Canadian law because all the rights were there already. They were inherent rights. And what we talked about in treaty was the opportunity for shaping new relationships. And I'm constantly reminded every day, Joan, about treaty because here in my home office, I have this treaty medal and I have another treaty medal hanging on the wall. You know, and I have, I have my bundle here. I have my headdress. I have my medicines here. You know, so I'm never allowed to forget about who I am as a treaty person. Mm. Fast, fast forward to the late 1960s, and you've got a Canadian government who's forgotten that it has responsibilities to treaty and to treaty people. They introduce <laughs> a white paper. Our chiefs at the time, including my, my, my late ancestor, Daniel Nipanak, signed what's called in Manitoba Wabung. It was the document of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood at the time. And that document talked about the need for Canada to create its own health legislation. Yeah. respecting indigenous people. Now, these were strong treaty leaders at the time, you know, that, and they remembered treaty because it was still very strong in the oral tradition, still very strong in the language. And they talked about the need for better health services for, for indigenous people as an outcome of our colonization. There's so much illness that, that we carry in our bodies, so much trauma that manifests into diabetes, uh, uh, and cr other chronic illnesses that oftentimes goes undiagnosed. Um, they knew that already in the 1960s, early 1970s. So in Canada, you, you need to provide better quality services in health to us as Indigenous people because we have a treaty right to health. So they said, you know, if it has to be legislation, it should be legislation. And that's right in the Wabung document, which right. was our pushback to the 1969 white paper, right? So I look back on that time and I thought, why would the chiefs back then ask for for health legislation when they were such strong treaty based leaders at the time. And what I began to think about was some of the teachings I had received from some of my elders who so you know, some of who have already gone, you know, to, to the other side. And I was reminded by um, the late Francis Niepenak. He told me one time, he said, our laws are the same, but they're the opposite. <laughs> and and that, that's such a profound statement because that could be interpreted in so many different ways. But the more I thought about it, you know, I thought, well, the, the, the introduction of, of health legislation in Canada for Indigenous people is not about applying law on us. It's about holding Canadian citizens to a standard of human rights that's not there today. Boom. Because right now, uh, health, health services in Canada for Indigenous people is entirely policy based. Yeah. Nobody feels that they, they, they have a responsibility to provide adequate and equitable health services to Indigenous people. Not the, province, not the provinces, not the federal <clears> government, because we're, we're what's called that jurisdictional football, you know, that hot potato. Nobody wants to hold that hot potato and take responsibility for that relationship. So for 150 years, we've been stuck in this policy space where one government strips away all the funding and provides very minimal services. We push back, the pendulum swings the other way, and then there's a government in place where all of a sudden they want to fund health services, they want to do health reform, they want to bring new enhanced uh, abilities for us to, to participate and receive the proper and adequate health services similar in line to the treaty right to health. And then the pendulum swings the other way and we're back at square one again. In 2006, the... Um, uh, the prime minister of the day, Paul Martin, met with, with Phil Fontaine and the AFN, and they, they hammered out what everyone called the Kelowna Accord. And in there, there was a lot of, a lot of money um, set aside for health reform, including uh, you know, the possibility that maybe health legislation and new regulations might take shape. And I'm not talking just about establishing a health authority, 
under the yeah. Canada Health Act. I'm talking about something separate and apart where there's gar guaranteed statutory funding. There's new health minimums in place that can be guaranteed, you know, by by Canadian law um, mm -hmm. to the standard of human rights, which aren't which currently aren't there today because we still have people dying in hospital waiting rooms and on hospital mm -hmm. beds and emergency yeah. rooms um, being misdiagnosed and sent home to die. It's still very prevalent, you know. So in 06, that opportunity came around. We call it the Kelowna, right? Mm -hmm. Kelowna died on the floor when, when Stephen Harper's government came into power. And, and some of the concepts from Kelowna, <clears throat> once again, reemerged with the Liberals taking power in 2016. When the Liberals came into power in 2016 under Trudeau, they introduced some new money to reestablish, you know, treaty working tables and to start talking about what treaty is again. And, and we've, we've leveraged that opportunity, you know, and, and, um, I know in Manitoba, as early as 2011, we were talking about Indigenous health reform, you know, and the, in, the need for Indigenous health law, because I had taken that from the 1960s, the leadership of that time, and I had decided that I would, I would build my platform as a Manitoba chief around that concept. And so it reemerged. Um, you know, I've, I've been involved in the conversation under federal Indigenous health legislation for the last three years or two years since I've been a chief again. I've been sitting at the technical table. I've been moving the resolutions through the through the process, through the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, and then through the Assembly of First Nations to try to bring us into a space where we can act, actually at least have a conversation about it, not be afraid of what reform looks like. Well, where is the resistance? Is there resistance to moving forward with legislative solutions? Uh, and then another question would be, where would the legislation be out of? Is it out of Section 35? Is it out of 9124? Is it out of 92? These are all constitutional sections. Like, where is it proposed that this legislation will flow out of? And that should have been my first question. And uh, anyway, go ahead. It, it's uh, th that, that question is... is um... Is, is, is I think premised on having a bit of a background or understanding of, 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 of indigenous law and the constitutional yeah. framework. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll answer it this way. Um, indigenous services, Canada has the mandate okay. for indigenous health legislation. Mm -hmm. We have asked why not crown indigenous relations? The minister, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Miller is the minister of crown indigenous relations. And part of his mandate is treaty implementation. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about health, we as Indigenous people are going to talk about the treaty right to health. Why is this mandate not in what's called CIRNAC, Crown Indigenous Relations, and why is it in ISC? Yeah. It's because Canada doesn't know what the treaty right to health is. And mm. it's afraid to make financial commitments and legal commitments to what they believe to be a fluid concept. Well, the that's, right to health. that's where the, the financial commitments will flow from the legal commitments. Like right now, I think... Um, I see what you're saying. Like if we right now they've got it for those of you who aren't lawyers and who aren't up on all this stuff or whatever, they've got it. The way I would explain it to an elder in my community is under, you know, 9124, which is where they took us and and took us and put us in that number there, you know then that number is there for them to point at to look after us because when they took our land, you know, whether it's by agreement and sacred agreement and all that, in effect, in the Canadian law, it ended up in our land ended up in Section 92, which is where the provinces have say so. And so they put us under the federal government for say so. And they took our land and our children and our education and a whole bunch of other things. So what you're talking about, Derek, is that now they've split that 9124 into two two departments like one that's kind of dealing with um more important things you know that i don't really know what the hell they're doing and then the other one is just business as usual so what i hear you saying is why do we have this important treaty discussion which would actually end up flowing out of should flow out of 35 so i'm open to creating some space in my heart and mind that having it in indigenous crown relations would at least move create the potential to move it over to 35 because 35 is the only place that a sovereignist will, will go if they will even go anywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, you're exactly, you're exactly right. In my perspective, Joan, you're exactly bang on. They, 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 they captured us, eh? Colonial law has captured indigenous people 
yeah. um, what we call First Nations in, in Section 9124. Um, under Section 9124, they created the Indian Act. And in the Indian Act under Section 6, they legally determine who an Indian is. So yeah. they today. decide, They decide. even still today, you're right, today in Ottawa, they're deciding who an Indian is and who isn't. Right so we're, we're, we're a captured identity. Yeah. You know, under 9124, under the Indian Act. And that's where this conversation is happening. The, 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 health, the health conversation is happening within that space. Um, you know, because Cyrenac is not... Here. I'd just like uh, to add, so I want to acknowledge and recognize your bravery for going inside that space. Because that space is so offensive. I mean, so, so offensive. And you more than anybody would know that with your educational background, both in ceremony and in the white law and white culture, that to go in there and to have a conversation that's based on our integrity as, as Indigenous people in a space that isn't even created for any of that. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to acknowledge you and thank you for, for going in there because that's another reason that I'm sure a lot of people are telling you that they're not happy. I, I appreciate that, Joan, because I... I know that, um, you know, in the past work that I've done, you've been on the treaty rides with me. You, you know how committed, like we all have been, putting our own physical well-being and health on the line so that we could carry the treaty message in the hopes that a future generation of our people, our children, our grandchildren will know what it's like to be a treaty Indian in today's Canadian colonial infrastructure. So it, it's always been there. But, you know, I've also seen... Um, as I said before, are people dying in the emergency rooms waiting to see a doctor? I've seen chronic illness um, overtake entire families. You know, I've seen an epidemic of diabetes. I myself, I'm struggling with diabetes now. You know, um, so, I, so I, I, have to, I have to do what I can to try to stay healthy for as long as I can. Um, we're stuck in that space, eh? So we have to do something. We can't, we can't stand still anymore. You know, mm -hmm. we can't stand still waiting for someone who owes us something. Yeah. We, we, we have to be willing to shift and look for what's the best available options today. Is, is there so, is. So in the visual you go. So 9124 is where we're captured legally in this country. And then um, they've split 9124 into these two departments. Goodness knows why. I think it personally I have some nasty things to say about why that split is there, but you know, in, in where they're having this discussion about our health is basically what I tell white people is, you know, we don't really get anything extra all, that any other poor Canadian gets. Like the the ridiculous insurance that we have um, as Canadians in general, whether you're on welfare or you're a registered Indian, it's the same plan, basically. You know, it yeah. covers the bare minimum nothing you can't have any brand name medication you can't like there's all it's just it, we're trapped in this space a social space a social net space where we're we're seen even though we are the indigenous people and this is our damn land we, we didn't come from japan we came from right here so this is our land and so we're trapped in this space where we're considered a social problem yes so what you're trying to do is take at least within the 9124 take that discussion from that social poverty space you know into at least a treaty relations space that ultimately would end up in legislation i hope flowing out of 35 you know that mm -hmm. recognize the treaty nation to nation look at my nails are dirty i'm in the bush <laughs> too funny <laughs> Anyway, I'm having a big speech here and I see this is how my God works, keeps me humble. I'm making a big speech and then I see my dirty <laughs> nails. Um, but to make, to even some people still won't agree, some of our people still won't agree that legislation flowing out of 35, like I know, um, God bless her, Jody Wilson Raybould, I totally admire her and I've read everything she's written and she's amazing. And uh, talks people in BC talk about it in terms of recognition legislation, you know, mm -hmm. and a sovereigntist would say, mm, same shit, different pile. Sorry, I'm not a part mm -hmm. of Canada. And yeah. so it's, it's a progression, I think. And I think that's where you're going. Right? 
I, I think, um, you know, when we look at recognition legislation, for example, just to take that for a moment, yeah. C92, an act respecting Indigenous children, uh, families, that's, that's partly recognition legislation. Because what it does is it, it recognizes that Indigenous people have an inherent right to raise their own children and their own families in the way and shape and form that they so choose. Um, and, and in exercising that right, they have the, the ability to reclaim their law and to apply it. And, and, and within, within the paramountcy of law, that Indigenous law has paramountcy or it will apply ahead of provincial law. You know, that's something that that's uh, that that's there within C92. So it is recognition, but it also has a you practical know, piece. I'm sorry, I'm running my internet through Starlink and a generator, sure. and there was a little bit of a wiggle in your, so uh, you cut out at Paramountcy. So yeah. explain, explain Paramountcy to people who are listening, if they're not lawyers. Really uh, I, I guess in, 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 in uh, Paramountcy is a, a constitutional law concept in terms of which law applies, uh, yeah. you know, within the constitutional framework. And for the longest time, um, colonial Canada had no space whatsoever for the existence or the idea that Indigenous people had laws. Yeah. Okay, so when 92, uh, C92 came out, what it did was it allowed for an express recognition that there's an inherent right to self-government when it comes to children and families that stays with Indigenous people. That's, I think, the first piece of legislation that we've seen that, that recognizes that. So from there, within the inherent right, we have the space to reclaim law. So we as Anishinaabe people, we spend the time sitting around the table talking about what did we do before treaty? How did we raise our children? How did we make sure that they were safe and protected? How did we take care of families? So we articulate that. We put it down on paper. And we're not creating new law, Joan, in C92. No, no. We're reclaiming and remembering our law. Mm. And that's, that's, that's no. kind of... How is legally in the framework, how is Canada, the justice, making space for that? Like in that, I haven't looked, I really haven't looked at C92. I'm just so busy in the bush mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing. I haven't really looked at any of this. And I think most Indigenous people haven't looked at any of this. So this is valuable. Like in once that conversation happens in our communities and we we're being funded to have those conversations right now. And once those conversations are concluded, where we remember and recognize again who we are as Indigenous people within our own legal paradigm, then what? Where does it go legally? I, I think what we're seeing is the is the is that process in motion right now. And let, let me let me let me premise what I'm gonna say, Joan, on the fact that I recognize you as already living our law. <laughs> you're you're a living example of Anishinaabe law in action. You know, and any, anyone that, that knows you knows the lifetime of commitment that you've made to taking care of family, to raising yeah. young people in a healthy oh. way, being a good partner, you know, being, <laughs> being loyal and dedicated to the land, working with, uh, you know, smoking fish. That's why your fingers are all, <laughs> your, your fingernails are dirty because you, you're, you're engaged, you're engaged with the land and that relationship that can never be broken. That's the law, Joan, right? It is the law. The rest yeah. of us are sitting around a table writing stuff down. <laughs> you know i want you to i want yeah, you to yeah, like yeah. the old people say write it down for me write it down yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so c92 you know the the act would would identify that there's recognition canadian colonial institutions recognize indigenous law and then they say this is what the framework can look like we want these minimum standards we want the canadian charter to apply okay your law will take precedent over provincial laws this is a standard in terms of best interests of the child. Your law can will will establish programs and services. So there's an interlocking. It's almost like a hybridization opportunity of who we are plugging into who they are. And at the end of the day, having a system in place that respects families, respects children, and respects who we are as Indigenous people with inherent rights. And, and the process is playing out. But there's a lot of political actors and a lot of uh, challenges that uh, are so in the many, way so it, many you know, um, and how how would that be operationalized though like is it again back to my 91 24 92 35 you know where where does this get where does c92 get operationalized like how when when to the woman who wants to come we're here at the nakana call you know and she wants to come here you know with her family because she wants to reclaim her her responsibility to to for the food and all of that medicine picking and all that who helps her mm -hmm. how is that gonna happen 
that 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 is a very uh, that's a practical challenge yeah. or an operational challenge that 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 we, we that brings in the conversation about how do we operate how do we we, we operate in Canada Canada operates on on Canadian currency it, it there's a, there's a king's treasury right and that currency is what operationalizes a lot of the agreements that we make in law or in regulation like right now in Canada every first nation has access to first nations child and family service dollars mm. those dollars are flowing after the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal decision with Cindy Blacksock and the AFN negotiating i think it was 43 billion dollars yeah. Some of that money is already in circulation and it's making its way to the First Nations communities to support families. Exactly like you said, Joan, if there's a mom and her kids and a, or a mom and a dad and their kids and they want to go out to, Nikin, Nikin, yeah, Nicole, yeah. to to where you're at to learn how to reattach to the land, to learn effective parenting, the community has the funding to support that. It's, mm. called, it's called prevention funding. Hmm. And the idea is that Communities will build their own capacity in program and service development so that kids can stay home and they can stay home. Mm -hmm. And moms and dads can stop feeling ashamed about the challenges they face mm -hmm. in a colonized world and get mm -hmm. the supports they need to be effective parents mm -hmm. and effective community members. There's there's funding there. My own community, for example, Pine Creek, Minigozi B, we have, I, th I think our budget this year is close to 1.8 million. Um, to, to, to spend on the development of services to help families reconnect. Yeah. It's called prevention funding. Yeah. And every community has that. We just have to be willing to spend it and, and utilize it in the best way possible. You know, yeah. but we're afraid. We're afraid to spend because we get called out on it if we're spending money in the community yeah. still. Yeah. And then I, I think there's a whole level. I mean, it's almost quarter two and I like to keep to the hour. I mean, an hour is a long time. I mean, I'm sure people are going to listen to this podcast because you're amazing anyway um and i'm a fan um i have to tell a funny story so one time um one time you and i were on a bike run and um you know brian i love my husband is he's my soulmate and yeah i just i just could mm -hmm. weep if i think about not being with him like i just <laughs> Anyway, so I take off. I'm riding my, my Harley with Derek somewhere and following him. And I insist on being the second one in the run. And I know that's caused you trouble <laughs> with other men who want to ride behind the big chief. And I'm like, no, get to the fucking back because I'm riding second because I'm riding for women and I'm riding mm -hmm. for the people and the families. And they're all like, you know, hate that bitch, you know, whatever. So there I am behind Derek. So we're on, we're on the news and uh, I call home and um, Brian says, how are you doing, honey? I'm like, I'm good. Sore, you know, a little bit sore, whatever. I, he said, you know, you TV today with all that leather on. <laughs> and then I, I said to him, he said, you better not run off with one of those bikers. And I said, Brian not ever they don't even have land like yours <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know why that segued in here but um i was conscious of the time and i wanted to um and we've really cut off a big discussion there i mean we we could talk so much more there's so many things but i wanted to spend a little of the time too for you to express yourself around why do you ride mm. you know cuz that's okay. important in 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 2000, in the, you know, what do you, what do you call this century? The 20,000s? I don't even know how to say it. You know, the 60s, 20, the 70s. 21st, 21st, the 21st century. Oh, okay. Thank you for yeah. orienting me to the century I'm actually in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. why have you chosen to do that as an Indigenous leader, you know, of, of some, you know, people know who you are? Well, I, th I think, um, you know, going back to when I was a boy, and I was on a little motorcycle on a little dirt bike. And I remember zipping around on the hills and the gravel and, and then wiping out. And, and when I woke up, I was looking up at the sky. I'm like, what just happened? You know, and I realized I'd wiped out on my bike and maybe I was knocked out for a second or something. But I, I remember, and I had a fear about that for a long time. You know, after that, I was a little bit fearful of loud sounding engines and, and, um, you know, so, so when I, when I got a little bit older, I'm like, I, I need to overcome these things. I need to be comfortable and I need to express myself because I, I, um, I, I don't like to live in fear, you know, mm. um, like even my law degree, for example, um, 
I could have went to the same school that I did my undergraduate degree in. I knew the campus. I knew everybody. I knew the teachers and I was comfortable there. I'm someone who always moves myself into uncomfortable spaces to uh. expand the scope of my, of my experience. That that's who I am. Yeah. So, so, you know, going back to the motorcycles, I, I, um, I, I needed to, to deal with that and I needed to feel free, you know, like, um, I, I'm a type of person who like, I, I have my home, you know, I have a, my home base, my home community, but I feel I'm part of such a bigger human and geographical experience that I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss a moment of life. So yeah. I want to, I want to be out there. I want to smell the air, you know, I want to, I want to traverse across the land. And, mm -hmm. and I think maybe in a past life, maybe I was on horseback a lot. You know, like maybe I rode horses all over the place. I don't, I don't know. But in this lifetime, it felt very important for me to get, to get back on the bike. You know, you get mm -hmm. kicked off the horse, get back on. So get back on, get back on the bike and, and, and become comfortable and, and mm -hmm. be, be, be okay being um, connected that way. And, you know, part of it too is, uh, is I'll be quite honest. It's an affirmation of my faith in the creator that he's going to take care of me. You know, and, and, and you've been there, Joan, I've ridden through, through torrential rains in Ontario behind semi trucks at night, yes. you know, and, and, you know, I've, I've done it without fear because mm. I believe that we've been protected in what we're doing mm. because mm. we're reclaiming space. We're carrying mm. an important message. And, um, and that feeds into the wounded knee ride, which I do just like, you know, chief Clarence Louie and Bernie Shepard and other leaders, from our community have been doing that ride since the, since the beginning. And I picked up on it. I think 2015 was our first year mm -hmm. that I, that, and you were there as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of expressing who we are, you know, mm -hmm. not, not being in agreement to be confined to, you know, the borders of our reserve oh. uh, serve to oh. say we're, we're here, we're present, we're all over the place and we've always been all over the place and we're con going to continue to be everywhere because that's who we are. This is our homeland and we're not going to be denied access to the beautiful places in, in our, in our territory. So when I go down to wounded knee on my bike each year, and I'm going again this year, you know, it's, it's a long ride. It's, it's plus 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. We stop in the middle of open fields where there's no trees to, uh, to shade us from the heat, you know, and, and, and what we do is we bring respect and honor to the interconnectedness of our nations, eh? Because we all, we all share a common trauma, and that is the imposition of colonization and colonialism in our homelands. And, and that imposition has been much more abrupt in some cases, like at Wounded Knee, when the United States Army, you know, it, it, it murdered uh, 300 unarmed men, women, and children and, and elders, you know. And, and that trauma is still fresh in the minds of people because it's within the living memory of some of the elders who come out and talk about what happened at Wounded Knee. So it's still very painful, you know, um, because our people yearn for respectful relationships. Our people yearn for equity and equality and respect yeah. in, in, in these complex social worlds we live in, and they deserve it. So I bring honor to that, that relationship by making sure that I make that run, um, mm. no matter how uncomfortable I am, because I'm more of a cold weather person. Yeah. You know? So I'm, I'm okay if it's yeah. plus 20, you know, but when it's plus 40 outside, like I'm melting and I'm very, yeah, you, well, you actually feel like you're cooking on the bike. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. And I said that to another rider one time uh, when I was on the MMIW run with uh, Charmaine William Larson there. And I was in, we were in uh, New Mexico and it was like 102 degrees and you're flying down a highway at, you know, 120 kilometers an hour, or whatever it is. And I actually felt like I was baking, yeah. cooking. Yeah. And then yeah. when we stopped at a gas station, I said that. And then this woman who lives in New Mexico, she's like, well, you are. <laughs> so, oh my God. Yeah, you're baking, but you're slow baking. You're slow. You're slow baking at a hundred. Slow cooking, eh? Slow yeah, cooking. Yeah. So, so, it, so that's it's a sovereign. It's an act of sovereign, spiritual sovereignty. Hey, I just absolutely. said a new thing. Spiritual yeah. sovereignty. It it is it is you know and you, you 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 meet new people along the way, um you know you you participate in ceremonies if you're invited to them you know, where you can. And it's just a, it's just a, it's, it's, it's an experience that, that we should not deny ourselves. You know, mm. when I was mm. younger, there's places I wouldn't go because I didn't feel like I was good enough to go into certain places, you know? Yeah. And I think even today, maybe some of our young people still feel that way, 
You know, I can't go there because I'm not good enough for that town or I'm not good enough for that city. And and I fought to overcome that, you know, yeah. um, because this place is our place. Yeah. 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 So that's how I feel. And that's why I ride and I'll ride until, you know, until I can't anymore. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm going to share a little how I feel. Um, I'm waiting for I feel frustrated because um, my friend Gord McNaught, he said to me years ago, he said, He's an old white guy. He calls himself an old fat white guy. He's an amazing person, amazing person. And he said to me, you know, Joan, he said, I think you're the only person I know that's living at least three distinct lives. <laughs> <laughs> and so my frustration around riding bumps up with, uh, you know, my love to be right where I am in this moment, you know, uh, because I won't be at the August ride to Wounded Knee again, you know, because I have to choose between... Uh, being here with Brian and the kids and the family, even though personally I would love to be there, you know, but I, I can't because I've made a commitment to, to this space and, and my family. And, and so that, that's difficult. That's really difficult personally. Um, I don't even know why I said that, but anyways, that's where I'm at. And why do I ride? Um, for me, I started riding. Uh, I, I rode, I was about 16, I think, and I was walking uh, on Portage Avenue in Winnipeg. There's a, there used to be a small McDonald's and a big walk-in McDonald's. I think it's some kind of Mr. Big and Tall store now. But back in the day, it used to be an indoor sit-down McDonald's restaurant. Not McDonald's, NW restaurant. And I was 16, and I was waitressing there going to high school. And this girl came out of the little a and and came right on to Portage Avenue and slapped me right in the face. And I fell down and and she was calling me squaw and all this stuff. And I had never had an experience like that in my life. And uh, I was just crying and oh my God, I was so traumatized. And she was jealous about, I don't know what she was jealous about. So then I went to the back of um, the A&W where I was heading to work and I couldn't start. That's when I start. I started smoking that day too. <laughs> and uh that's where, I, and so I was in the back of the staff room there crying and crying and crying. And um, this um, guy who was hanging out in the small, black guy, he was, Clarence his name was, he was hanging out in the small A&W. And he came running after me and he, he found me and he, I couldn't stop crying. And he said, stop crying and I'll teach you how to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> And I had never even thought about riding a motorcycle and, you know, but I used to see the bikers, eh? And I used to think they were so cool and so mm -hmm. tough as, a, as, you know, victimized misogyny, colonialism, all that stuff. I thought I, I, I needed that power and I wanted to feel safe, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so when Clarence said that he was a street racer, he had a, a Kawasaki and he was a mechanic and he used to um, soup up his bike. And so, it was so fast. Like he was so fast. <laughs> Don't do this. I'm not recommending anybody do this, but so <laughs> he taught me how to ride. And then I yeah. bought a bike and he souped up my carb. And I, I had so many tickets at one point, I had to go in front of that board where you have to explain why you need your license. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I have a love of speed. I have a love of going fast yeah. and I just love it. And the freedom Mm -hmm. You know, but for those of you that love me, I don't go too fast anymore because I'm old. And my Harley, this guy scared me on another run in the States. He said, oh, how do you make out with the Harley Wobble? I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, oh, you haven't heard of the Harley Wobble? And I was like, no. And he said, well, some bikes at a certain speed, they just start to wobble and that's it. It's all over. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to go. I don't want to know about that. <laughs> so yeah. I stick to 120. That's fast enough, you know, whatever. The odd mm -hmm. time between... um. Fort Nelson and no Fort Fort St. John and Fort Nelson. There's a four hour strip of the Alaska highway. That's beautiful. It's cooler all the time and there's really hardly any traffic. And sometimes in that space, I open it up to maybe one 30 because you know, I don't want to hardly wobble anyway. So I, I, I love the speed. I love the freedom. I love feeling powerful as a woman and in control of my own body, like a hundred percent, just me and God. And that's the piece. The main piece is it's so spiritual. It's so mm -hmm. spiritual. 
people. Because the only way I can face that fear is if I connect, if I connect, you know, mm -hmm. if yeah. I connect. And, you know, if you think you're dead, like it's not about, you know, ruminating about whatever memory. You're present and yeah. in the moment and you're in the moment with your God. And I yeah. love that. I love that. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, uh, the claiming space thing for our people. I was, um, and I follow my body, like I follow my body. And um, Charmaine William Larson and I were riding through um, Alabama. And I don't know what came over me. All of a sudden, I started screaming. And nobody was around, just me and her flying along, you know. And all of a sudden, my body was yelling and I was screaming. And I was like, this is our land. I take it back. I was just like, <laughs> yelling my head off for about a half an hour. I couldn't stop. Like, I couldn't. I was like, oh, my God, you're crazy. But I, it was like, so it's such a powerful reclamation of mm -hmm. our indigenousness on our land, you know? And Absolutely. So that's, I think I just wanted to end with, with kind of wrap it up and then you could, I want you to make some closing comments. Like, you know, earlier I wrote down that you said, um, you know, we're a hot potato, you know, like we're a hot, we're a legal hot potato because this is our land. Mm -hmm. That's why we're a legal hot potato, you know, mm -hmm. because Absolutely. acknowledging us properly is going to cost this country money. Because like you said, money is the way that things happen. So that it's it's not me who created the money system, you know, but mm -hmm. our land, and I don't mean any disrespect at all, you know, but five bucks and some lard is not a good deal. You know, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. It's not. And sugar. Now we're all dying, you know, of too much fat and too much sugar. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's because of the land. They don't know what to do because they have to acknowledge that this is our land. Mm -hmm. That's going to cost them money. Yeah. And Canadians are all, I wrote an article recently where they're like willfully blind. They're all like ostriches with, they're just like, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm like, oh my God, wake up is the first thing you should do. You know, mm -hmm. educate yourself and, and get to know an Indian, you know, make a mm -hmm. friend or two. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. I got all wrapped up. What are your closing comments there? Chief? <laughs> well, you covered a lot there, Joan. Like when you started out riding and, you know, being in Winnipeg and, you know, the, the, um, what really resonated with me was, you know, being subjected to violence as a young Indigenous woman on the streets of Winnipeg. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know when that happened, but that happened, you know, um, at, and, and that's still happening today. It's it's happened in my family. Um, yeah. I'll tell you right now, I, I've, I've always struggled in the conversation that we have around missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, uh, two spirits, um, missing and murdered Indigenous men. Um, <clears throat> I've struggled in there because I have my own trauma from my own family's loss when I was a little boy, you know, uh, mm. um, th the cities are very violent places still. Um, it, the, the violence takes different shapes. Sometimes it's not as, mm. as abrupt as, you know, a woman walking up to a young girl and slapping her down because she's indigenous. It, it manifests in different ways. Um, you know, uh, I'm dealing with that right now, you know, in, in another city with, with one of our members where, you know, there's a non-Indigenous board that's taken over an Indigenous organization and, uh, and they're trying to push the Indigenous perspective and the Indigenous lens out of the, the process. And, and on, the, on the surface of it, you know, it, it looks all legitimate, but really it's taking away and robbing our space that we had claimed as Indigenous people. And it's happening. That's violence, too. Too, too. You know, when 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 uh, when a board says, "Oh, we we don't want elders here anymore," that's violence. You know, and um, it's it, it's a conversation that needs to continue. You know, I think it's a conversation that has to include Indigenous men as well because we're we're hurting too. Like we're not right. we're not trying to be involved for the, for any political gain or for any any political um, agenda. We just, we're also part of the healing that has to come mm. from the yeah. willingness to have these conversations. So I appreciate you raising that. And, you know, um, I remember the years of, of riding with you, um, you know, our first treaty freedom ride, and uh, it'll always be burned in my brain, you know, driving down the highway and looking in my rear view mirror and there's Joan. There was, <laughs> it was as consistent for, for, for days and days on, on end. 
um, you're right there in my rear view mirror, you know, and, and being part of that and, and undertaking the challenge and being there step, step in step with, with, with everybody else. It, it really, it really added to the enrichment of the experience, you know, and I, I, I'm so appreciative of that I'll be appreciative of that my whole life, you know, and mm -hmm. when I'm riding down a wounded knee this year, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about you thinking, geez, it would have been nice to have Joan here with us again to make this trip, you know, yeah. so yeah. But life's about trade-offs, and I recognize you're, you're you're making your priorities known, you know, and and I respect that, you know. So, um, I think those are my comments, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate the time you've given me. I hope that your listeners have have kind ears when they listen <laughs> in. To what they have to say. So. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, and um, I'm gonna close when I when I stop the live feed. Yeah, you will just say goodbye to each other privately because we'll still be on like we were before we started. Okay. Um, and I decided long ago, I love I love laughing. You know that, Derek. I'm half crazy. Mm -hmm. So I decided that Brave Indigenous Conversations with Joan Jack is primarily all about the earrings. So these... <laughs> So I decided that every part I have an earring addiction, bad, bad earring addiction, beaded earring, silver earrings. Yeah. As long as they're indigenous, I'm, I'm so addicted. So these earrings are a very simple design and I decided to feature, I'm justifying my addiction here. You see, I decided to feature a woman's art. Um, and the, I have a couple of pair from men, but not many, um, every, every session. So these were made by Donna Jim. And you can find her on Facebook, Donna Jim, and she's a beginning beater. And although this is a very simple beginning design, I love her color choice and they're so graceful and elegant. And I think we should support our beginning artists. I like the, 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 um, like the streak of gold that she put all the way through the middle that you really got to look at it to see them. So these are, I'm wearing Donna Jim's today. <laughs> Her mother also, Pamela Jim, does beautiful moccasins and beading and stuff. And I think Pam has her own website now. So, yeah. Very uh, nice. Very nice, yeah. So I think we're good. Miigwech. All right. Miigwech. <laughs>